participants shared that the K-State Garden Hour series is delightful, informative, and helpful. Eight out of 10 K-State Garden Hour participants reported increasing their physical and or emotional health through the skills they gained in our webinars. 82% of Kansas Garden Hour participants harvested fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs they grew with the help of our webinars. 90% of K-State Garden Hour participants reported they used unbiased and research-based information to solve plant and garden problems after participating in our webinars. Plant Heroes Wear Purple. Discover K-State Garden Hour at ksre-learn.com slash k-state garden hour and become your own garden superhero. Welcome to the 2022 K-State Garden Hour summer, summer Kickoff Series. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If you're a regular, welcome back. We are happy to have you joining us again. This webinar series began in spring 2020 as they hope to share extension gardening education during the height of the pandemic. With much success, we've reached over 16,000 garden enthusiasts just like you. This webinar is hosted by Kansas State Research and Extension. My name is Anthony Reardon, and I am the horticulture agent uh, for the West Plains Extension District. I am also your host today. Everyone involved in the, <coughs> in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticultural education or a related discipline. But most of all, we each have a love for educating and sharing important gardening topics. I know here in Finney and Scott counties, I have several gardeners and master gardeners that love watching these webinars to continue furthering their education. And it really has been a fantastic tool for doing just that. Before we get started, we do have a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Please use the Q&A feature for questions related to the presentation. This is where we will look for questions in the Q&A session. You should see a button along the bottom of the tab, tab that says Q&A. Just click on that and you will be able to enter your questions that way. Our moderators today are Pam Paulson and Dennis Patton. They will be sharing information through the chat during the presentation. They will also help us facilitate the Q&A portion of the webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded and we will put it on our K-State Garden Hour website. We typically upload additional resources related to each topic as well. If we share links to the chat, uh, we will also link them on our website. Our website is also where you will have access to previous topics and upcoming topics for the 2022 series. Our moderator will send the link for this over the chat right now. Uh, today's topic is organic pest management for vegetable gardens. Uh, I am pleased to introduce our speaker, to speaker today, Zach Hoppenstead. He is the horticulture extension agent for Johnson County Extension Office based out of Olathe. He specializes in fruit and vegetable, vegetable production amongst many other topics. Uh, please give us a few moments while we transition and share the presentation slides. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay, and I'll share my screen here. So hopefully y'all can see some organic vegetable pest management title slide there. And, um, and probably based on the feedback from the chat, a lot of you can recognize these little nymphs and, and this egg cluster um, on the underside of, uh, of what I would imagine is a cucumber uh, or a squash uh, leaf. And, uh, it uh, sounds like a lot of you have issues with this uh, pest, uh, the squash bug, based on the survey results. Um, and so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, options for organic growers, which I would say is a very large segment of our home gardener audience. Um, folks that are interested in using um, products that are derived from natural sources that uh, have um, less persistence and residual effect in the environment. Uh, and uh, I'll get right into the definition here. Um, defining organic pesticides in, in narrow terms. Today, we're gonna to be talking about substances, deterrents, chemical toxins, uh, and other organisms derived from natural sources that are used for destroying insects. These could be plant extracts, microbes, minerals, biological predators, uh, parasitoids, et cetera. 
Um, and, and we will talk about these products because I do want folks to leave with an idea of what is available in terms of um, uh, pro uh, retail products available to uh, consumer level gardeners. Um, these are uh, products that you could uh, probably find at uh, your local garden store or, or some of the big box stores even. And organic products are becoming um, uh, more and more widely available. Um, but uh, uh, just, I don't want, uh, ideally, I think based on the survey questions, we don't want folks to walk away thinking that um, the, the way to be most ecologically sound or most in balance with nature is just selecting a product with a certain label or a product that is um, sourced uh, from uh, natural ingredients. But have you guys thinking about organic uh, gardening and pest management more holistically? Um, so, you know, whether you're using conventional, and I guess I can see some of our results here that are coming up. Um, which I'll reflect on uh, here shortly. But whether you're using organic or conventional pesticides to control, uh, we're going to largely be talking about insect pests. Um, you know, both can kill both. Uh, you know, we in our in our landscapes we have both uh, both pest and beneficial insects, and actually a lot more beneficials and um, and insects that um, are more or less. Uh, you know, neither necessarily pr pr bringing a lot of benefit in terms of uh, being predators or, or parasites on pests, but um, have, a, have a different ecosystem role. And I'll get into some of those different roles that, that insects have in the landscape, but mostly either have little, either no effect on your vegetable garden or a beneficial effect, far more than the pests that we encounter. And so regardless of whether you're using a conventional organic product, um, both can both can kill the good as well as the bad. Um, and so I'll give you an introduction introduction to some of the beneficial insects that we can find in the garden and hope hopefully help you if not train your eye to see those. Um, and I, and I do want you to become more um, aware of the different species that are in the garden. but even if that's not something that you're curious or that you end up spending a lot of time out there with a hand lens, looking and identifying uh, insects in the garden, just realizing that they're out there and that the choices that you make, the products that you use in the garden uh, does have an effect on both good and bad insects. Um, and really like not trying to villainize folks that are using uh, conventional or synthetic pesticides. There's a place for both organic and, uh, and conventional products in good agricultural practices, but um, inform yourself as a consumer, learn about the products that you're using um, and what some of the environmental impacts are um, instead of making assumptions. Um, although I don't want you to be focused exclusively on labels, and that's not what I want you to, to walk away with in, in entirety from this presentation, these are the, the labels that you will look for in the garden center when you're selecting products that are organic certified. Um, those products are managed through the Organic Material Review Institute, as well as registered with the EPA. Um, and so sometimes you'll see both of these labels, or at least one typically on a product that's certified for uh, certified organic, or that can be used in certified organic farming. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we did a presentation last year, and you can find the recording on the K-State Garden Hour um, about more broadly about organic agriculture and organic gardening. And um, I think that some of the, some of the, the focus of the larger national organic program that's run through USDA focuses on improving soil health biological diversity in farms and gardens and trying to reduce off farm inputs, in which case um, a, a good example of that would be going and purchasing an insecticide, but rather trying to um, establish more cultural practices that can prevent uh, pest outbreaks rather than having to go and purchase products or inputs from off farm or off garden in this case. Um, and one thing that I'm sure a lot of our master gardeners will be familiar with um, and it, as a term and a discipline within entomology and crop production uh, is integrated pest management. And this is uh, sort of a holistic approach to, um, to 
making an intervention or in some cases not intervening with uh, pest issues that we encounter in the garden and sort of a, a hierarchy or a or a, a, a step by step process where we um, uh, exhaust all of the least intervention or least impactful from an environmental perspective or chemical perspective um, methods of control first before we get to the use of, of insecticide or pesticide uh, products. So uh, we're typically talking about cultural practices. So, and, and, and I'll detail that a little bit more specifically what I mean when I'm talking about cultural practices. Um, and then physical or mechanical. So this could be going out and picking uh, caterpillars or um, you know, uh, feeding insects in the garden, uh, pest insects in the garden, biologicals. Typically when we're using the term biological, we're referring to um, another uh, beneficial insect or nematode that can be used to either as a predator or as a parasite. To, um, to mitigate or to control the, the pest that we're trying to eliminate. And then the last, um, the last uh, in interventions or um, um, uh, methods for control would be using a chemical product. And chemical can refer to both organic, uh, organic approved or uh, chemicals that come from uh, natural sources as well as synthetic chemicals. Um, so, um, and, and in a lot of cases, uh, synthetic chemicals can be very closely related to their natural or organic counterparts, um, but definitely uh, um, have a reputation uh, for last for having um, uh, longer residual in the environment and, po and possibly in some cases creating more damage uh, to other animals and beneficial insects in the garden or in the farm. So um, kind of um, in another way of thinking about integrated pest management, especially as it relates to managing insect pests and the, with edible crops in a garden is, you know, understanding that if we're thinking we're going to eliminate insects completely from the garden, then um, we really, uh, that's a flawed mentality. Um, you know, insects serve uh, many beneficial roles in our landscape and in the environment. Uh, and uh, there are, if given the opportunity, predators and parasites that will actually control uh, vegetable garden pests. Uh, there are millions of species of insects, the, in some cases thousands in our, in our backyard, and a huge population of quint over quintillions, um, which uh, is one, two past a trillion um, that are living on the you know, planet at any time. So they outnumber us. Um, and uh, like I said, provide a lot of beneficial ecosystem services. We need to appreciate the good things that they bring, learn more about them. And even when it comes to pests, understand more about the pests, their life cycles, when they're most vulnerable and what sort of interventions we can employ that will be most successful and least impactful to the greater environment. Um, uh, and that includes our pets and birds and, and uh, mammals and reptiles that, uh, that we also don't want to cause damage to. Um, so understanding that, you know, we, an us versus them would be a losing battle, appreciating insects. Uh, uh, I think I'll definitely encourage you to really focus on like I said, some cultural practices that promote healthy plant growth, which are just kind of for a lot of the master gardeners or folks that have been gardening for a long time are gonna, is gonna be common sense and just good crop production techniques. Um, choosing plants, in some cases, choosing plants that have some resistance or are not quite as attractive to some of the common pest uh, insects that we have. Uh, but also possibly selecting some that are more resistant to certain diseases uh, that make them more vulnerable to insect pests. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about how like um, being a bit creative with our planting schedule and, and I'm sure one resource that I'll refer to several times during this presentation will be the Kansas Garden Guide. For those of you that are in the state, 
Um, this is one of the best resources for folks that are either, you know, very seasoned or beginning vegetable growers in our state and provides a lot of regional specific information. And one thing that I really love in that publication, I'm sure that some of my um, colleagues can bring it up in the chat, are um, the seasons and, and the, the, the approximate planting dates. And there's, and there's a range um, that is common and where um, plants can be successful in terms of soil temperature and and um, the, the weather conditions that are most conducive to certain vegetable types. Um, but you know, planting a little bit later or starting a little bit earlier with transplants um, can go a long way towards having a plant that's more resilient and stronger and um, uh, more resistant to some of the insect pest pressures. Planting differently, rotating crops, putting uh, crops that are more susceptible in different locations of the garden, anything that you can do to kind of trick or confuse some of these pest uh, garden pests. Um, and intelligent interference is kind of in line with the with the integrated pest management concept. You know, depending on what your threshold is for for damage, and there are different there are different recommendations that exist, and and that is a resource that we can provide. Um, uh, through different extension services, like the certain percentages of different types of insect pests that you're viewing. And once it goes over a certain percentage, this is especially important in commercial farming that you know they, there's this essentially thres thresholds that have been established. You'll develop your own thresholds in your garden um, about when you intervene and when you decide to uh, apply certain products. And um, there are resources that can help you do that, but you need to make a decision on whether the damage is going to interfere with you getting um, a productive crop or having fun in the garden. In some cases, you know, gardening may not necessarily be about providing all of the you know, cucumbers or squash that you need for the whole summer, but just you know, having a good time, getting some exercise, being outdoors, and so you have to decide what your intention is with gardening, what you're trying to accomplish, and also what your crop production goals are. And once the damage gets to a certain threshold, um, you may need to intervene. But in some cases, damage may be superficial uh, with some types of insect feeding uh, or certain insect pests. And, and really there may, may not be necessary to do anything. In some cases, just waiting for beneficial uh, predators or parasites to intervene may be the best course of action. Um, so educate yourself about the pests that you're seeing, uh, identifying uh, the, the symptoms that you're seeing and correctly uh, uh, connecting that with the pest species. And, and if you're um, having issues doing that, that's where you know reaching out to your local extension agent, providing some pictures of the plant damage that you're seeing in the garden and uh, getting a better idea of things like the life cycle, when that pest is most vulnerable, what products are most uh, are at lowest risk and most safe to use for the home gardener. Um, and then eventually making that decision on whether or not you'll interfere. That's this idea of intelligence, intelligent interference. Um, like I said, cultural practices, it's the first thing on that integrated pest management tri triangle. It's our first line of defense. We really should make sure that we've exhausted everything we can in terms of just providing plants with the basic necessities um, for good plant growth. So making sure they have good soil that's fertilized well or um, you know, has a lot of compost or organic uh, matter, uh, that they have access to full sun. They're not in a shady uh, waterlogged area in the back of the garden, which I, I guarantee you will make them more susceptible to both pests and disease. Um, in some cases that they're being irrigated uh, correctly and, and watered um, appropriately. You know, we should be aiming for about an inch of precipitation, natural rainfall every week. We've definitely been getting a lot of, of rainfall up here in the northeast part of the state, um, but especially for folks in drier locations, uh, most of our vegetable crops, um, we're looking to get uh, about an inch of rainfall per week. And if you're not, you need to supplement that with irrigation. Um, and like I said, making sure that plants are healthy, fertilized, have the nutrients, the essential nutrients that they need 
um, to be productive and put on a lot of growth quickly so that um, especially young and immature plants are the most susceptible to some of the insect um, pests that we'll talk about today. Uh, other cultural practices, you know, the timing of your planting, like I've already mentioned, uh, planting a little bit later, planting a little bit earlier so that you can avoid some of the life cycles for, mo for more common pests, pests that have multiple generations that spend a period of time pupating underground. Um, you know, you can have some success with planting certain crops a little bit later, especially with squash and cucumber, which I'll talk about specifically later. Making sure your plants are spaced correctly. Um, and a lot of this information, once again, is in the Kansas Garden Guide in terms of uh, recommended plant spacing so that there's good airflow and there's not like uh, heavy pockets and a lot of debris for pests to, to hide in. And even um, in that case, when you're using a pesticide um, that you're not able to get good coverage or uh, uh, contact uh, with pests with insects because of overcrowding in the garden. So pruning, spacing, irrigation. Um, in some cases, we'll talk about uh, barriers, which, which I would consider more of a mechanical uh, control, which is one step up from cultural, but these are preventative techniques. Selecting varieties, like I already mentioned, really more on the disease side, but like for example, with cucumber beetles, where we're concerned about bacterial wilt or cucumber mosaic virus, which um, they are vectors for. So like, if we know we have cucumber beetle issues, consistently selecting varieties with that sort of disease resistance. And there's not a ton of research in my experience on plant cultivars or vegetable cultivars that are more resistant to, um, to pests, to insect pests, but there is some. Um, and uh, just because squash and cucumbers are definitely a very afflicted crop in our area, you know, there is some research to su suggest that some of the burpless or less bitter types of cucumbers are producing less uh, uh, um, uh, aromatics. Uh, uh, cuber, cucurbitacins is what they're called. I almost uh, couldn't get that out of my mouth. Cucurbitacins uh, are the aromatics that attract a lot of uh, squash bugs and cucumber beetles and a lot of the pests that feed on melons and squash and cucumber. And um, there are some varieties that produce a little bit less of those aromatic chemicals. So uh, in some cases, they may attract less. And I think that planting a diversity of crops using K-State's recommended vegetable variety list and planting a, a variety of different cultivars within the same plant type, you can start to observe um, you know, in your own growing space whether there are certain varieties that, that appear to be less attractive. On the organic side, you know, uh, Weeding is a full-time job and there's not a lot of great organic insecticides that are out there, which I talked about a little bit in last year's presentation. So you become familiar with all, there's a variety of different hoes and every organic gardener who's been doing this for a while knows the name for all the hoes on this, um, uh, on this page. Um, and uh, that's kind of, uh, a gift and a curse, if you will. So, um, but keeping the space clean, weed free, a lot of um, wild weed species can also be hosts for insect pests. And so uh, keeping a, a relatively clean space in the garden area can be helpful, especially eliminating, starting to learn about what are wild hosts that grow in the area as weeds. Um, and trying to eliminate those as much as possible. But aside from that, which is kind of counterintuitive, but uh, made it to some degree to what I'm saying previously, um, remove the weeds, but also create a lot of diversity. Um, and so it, it really is, it's an ongoing learning process, trying to create habitat for beneficial insects, animals, reptiles, um, birds, and if there's a lot of birders in the audience, they probably can talk a little bit about some of the, um, the insect uh, predator capacity that uh, some of our native bird species have. And so attracting birds into the garden can be actually a really effective way for insect control. It's not something I'll go into a lot of detail about, but um, trying to create you know, a, um, 
a, a gardenscape that that reflects nature and that is as diverse as uh, a forest and a meadow, um, and um, and and that won't happen overnight. But it, it's definitely something that you should. You know, try to for for folks that are on a patio space, it, it may not be quite as easy. But um, you know, whether it's just having some uh, flowers that are in bloom in addition to to your container plants, but trying to create um, a more diverse uh, landscape, regardless of it's small or a you know forty acre backyard space, where you're able to to be more creative and, and incorporate more perennials and annuals and have more animals and birds and, and reptiles. Um, so, you know, everything is on a spectrum, but the more complex the ecosystem is, generally the more stable it is. Um, this is kind of, uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the more common beneficial insects that you'll encounter here in the state. Um, and you know, around around in North America, more generally as well. Um, but for folks that are especially interested in um, in non-edible crops, in flowering plants, uh, natives, uh, and as well as like annual bedding plants, for example, um, that can attract beneficials and create hab habitat for insectaries for beneficials. Uh, really, you're thinking about things that are, you, you're basically wanting, trying to create a garden that's constantly in bloom. Um, you have to keep in mind that a lot of the beneficial insects that, we're, that we'll talk about don't necessarily have the anatomy that makes them great for, um, for accessing nectar and pollen, which all of these beneficials for the most part uh, are trying to access. That's what they need. And that's why we want flowers out in the garden and things that are blooming to attract them. Um, but they may not have, uh, they may not be able to feed inside of deep flowers. So usually flowers that we say that are like in the, um, the aster family, like sunflowers, where they have like hundreds of thousands of disc flowers in the center, in addition to the, to the petals on the outside, um, where there's pollen and lots of like shallow pollen and nectar sources, or for example, in the photo here, you can see yarrow, and I think that's Queen Anne's lace is the, is the white flowering um, bush. Um, those are example of kind of like, uh, although yarrow is not an umbilifer, I believe Queen Anne's lace is technically in the carrot, carrot family. And you know, plants in that family all have those um, kind of, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, when it's on a rainy day, you wanna have your umbrella, umbilifer flower umbrella, uh, these flowers are, are wide, there are a multitude of flowers, and they're easily accessible by beneficial insects. So um, that's the idea. Also flowers that are in the, the milkweed family can also be uh, an example of a multi-flower bloom that can attract beneficials. Um, and there's a, lot, there's a lot more resources on that subject. Um, this list specifically, and Dennis can probably, or one of the uh, one of my colleagues can pull this up in the chat. But our fantastic extension entomologist has this great publication on managing uh, common vegetable garden pests, and this table comes from that publication. And that publication um, really will go over a lot of the same topics that we're that we're talking about in the presentation today, um, and I think would be worth sharing in the chat. Cover crops, we talked about this a little bit last year, you know, generally uh, cover crops are sort of like living mulches that we put down during fallow periods or in between different crop uh, rotations or, or plantings in our garden so that we don't ever have a true fallow period where the soil is totally bare. They're um, sometimes planted in the fall to overwinter or like buckwheat can even be planted in the summer and they bloom very quickly. Buckwheat is a great example of, uh, of a cover crop that can provide habitat for beneficial insects, as well as um, a lot of legumes like hairy vetch, which is a common uh, legume, which provides um, soil fertility as a cover crop, but also can provide a lot of uh, nectar for beneficial insects. Legumes are really uh, great option for creating a div more diverse flowering 
vegetation in the landscape. Not only do they flower, but they also have what are called what's called extra floral nectar. So they produce nectar outside of just the flower parts, but also on the stem and at nodes. Um, and that's a really cool uh, sort of feature that certain plants have to help attract uh, uh, insects that can protect that plant and also um, bring in some of those predators and parasites for our um, insect pests that we're trying to manage. So once we've gone past cultural practices, then we start looking at physical and mechanical techniques. So um, depending on how big your garden is, you're going to be irritated when I say go out there and just, you know, go out a couple times a week and, and hand pick the caterpillars off of your cabbage. And you'll say, Zach, I've got, you know, 100 row feet of cabbage and that takes too much time. I'm not going to do that. Um, and that's fair. Um, because depending on your scale, certain techniques are gonna be more or less feasible. Um, and, and that also goes in line with some of the comments earlier about you know, understanding why pesticides are used in, in large scale agriculture. And some of it has to do with what is efficient, and what's feasible in terms of labor and, and um, time and, and uh, the margins of their business. So, um, but there are other types of products that can also create a, a barrier. This uh, product that you're seeing the photo of on Apple is um, what's called kale and clay. It's it's a natural mineral product. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pulverized clay powder that is mixed with water and then creates this film on top of vegetables or it's, it's used widely in fruit plantings. And it essentially creates a surface that's not recognizable to the pest and not, um, it, it dries their body out in the cuticle on the outside of their body at different life stages and they don't wanna be on it. It's not 100% effective. It needs to be replied almost every time that it rains after a heavy rain, um, which makes it definitely uh, laborious to apply regularly. Um, but it is a very low risk, low impact product. It can be used on a variety of uh, different crops that are susceptible to insect pests. And, um, and I'll mention a few of those as we go along. Sticky traps, at least as a way to monitoring, as monitoring, you know, bright yellow uh, uh, with adhesive on it, you can make them yourselves, but this can be a way for you to at least scout and see what's out in the garden. A lot of pests are nocturnal or are very good at hiding. And so putting out some sticky traps in the orchard or uh, in the garden bed can, uh, will, will have a tendency to catch some of your insect pests and at least give you a better chance of identifying what's going on and um, an early indicator. And then that can be used as your informed, um, as your knowledge base for deciding whether you're gonna interfere or make or apply a pesticide, for example. And a strong spray of water is another example, especially with aphids and even with spider mites. Um, if you can uh, take a strong blast of water to the undersides of the leaves, you can really remove a lot of those types of small, soft-bodied insects. And it takes them a very long time to move, and they sometimes will never get back um, into the foliage. Another sort of barrier technique that I think is very important for folks that are interested in organic gardening, they need to understand that, you know, th this is a technique that is becoming more and more employed um, using uh, agricultural blankets or uh, fabrics. Uh, some, of the, some of the product names are on the page here, Agribond, Rime, Agril. Um, and, and for pest management, you're going to be, you know, because these can be used as frost blankets to help crops over winter. But what you're going to be looking for are very, the very thinnest, lightest weight offerings that um, all of these manufacturers have. Um, they're going to let the most light into the planting, which is important that you have uh, good um, light transmission for good crop growth. Um, and they're also going to, um, they're not going to get quite as hot as the heavier fabrics will. The, the, the sort of lightest weight, best light transmission option for, for strictly insect protect, protection, not for any sort of frost protection, would be more of a nylon netting like protect net. Um, and there's other um, kind of DIY materials that folks use. 
Um, but these are, these are, you know, retailed to gardeners and um, are effective. I've used both of them in the demonstration gardens that I manage. The ProtectNet, um, it lasts for multiple seasons generally. It's a little bit more durable and it doesn't get quite as hot during peak summer. Um, and so for, especially for summer plantings, I tend to opt for more of a nylon netting. Um, but if you can get that on, especially with, with squash plantings um, from the time of transplant, you can really exclude a lot of the early season squash bugs. So like I said, insects have a lot of different roles on the planet um, beyond just how they impact our vegetable garden. They um, you know, are insect for birds, frogs, bats, lizards and um, they decompose organic matter. They obviously, we know about their significance as pollinators and, and all the crops, all the fruit, fruiting crops that we eat are dependent on those pollinators, so much of our diet. And, uh, but also they, uh, they balance out each other. And, and I'll talk to you now a little bit about some of the predators and parasites that we can encounter that help manage naturally some of the pests in the garden if we let them do that. Um, so, uh, looking at this photo right here, you might go out to the garden and see this creepy crawly thing. And, and I talked a little bit about this last year, how our first inclination can be like, okay, I see an insect on a leaf in my garden. I need to spray, but understanding that there, um, are, there are more good bugs out in the garden than there are pests. Um, you can purchase uh, there are insectaries and wild harvesting specifically with ladybugs, which is a little bit, um, I think there's um, definitely some, uh, some debate or over the sustainability of ladybug harvesting. And that would not be my first recommendation for a home gardener, but um, there are, uh, uh, there are insectaries and companies that rear mites, insects, wasps, and nematodes for consumer gardeners and commercial farmers, um, and especially in high tunnel and greenhouse production, these can be very effective. Um, but for a home gardener, um, working in, in the open air, uh, not in an enclosed space like a greenhouse, uh, I generally don't recommend that, that you go out and try to bring in beneficials, but rather try to create habitat which attracts them naturally. Nematodes might be the one exception. Um, these are microscopic worms that can be applied, um, that can be mixed with water and then usually applied as like a soil drench. And they can be effective at managing, a lot of you guys talked about Japanese beetle. If they're applied when the grubs are, um, when the grubs are active in the soil, they actually can be kind of effective at transmitting bacteria, which ultimately is lethal to uh, a lot of grub and larval stages of soil pests uh, or, or pests that spend some portion of their life cycle in the soil. Um, ladybug uh, or uh, ladybird beetles or ladybugs are kind of the iconic um, example of beneficial insects. And a lot of us just aren't familiar with what they look like in their larval stage. Um, so, um, you know, after ladybug lays an egg, it has a, a larval stage that kind of almost, um, you know, is kind of spider-like there in the top right-hand corner. And then it pupates uh, in the bottom right-hand uh, and, you know, in some cases we might see that and decide that we need to spray a pesticide, but in fact, these are voracious eaters of aphid uh, and even squash bug eggs. So this, this is an important beneficial that we don't want to eliminate. Um, green lacewing is another very, um, very uh, popular and, and well-known beneficial. Um, it is, uh, ha eats aphids, mealybugs, scales, white flies, thrips, spider mites. And, um, and other plant pests. It's some, the, the larva stage is kind of the most active feeding stage and it's sometimes called the aphid lion. Um, so that's another one. And, and obviously its eggs are very interesting how it, they're essentially connected um, to these kind of hair-like structures, which I believe is so that the, the hatching larva don't, are, are, don't cannibalize 
um, the, the eggs that, are, that still are unhatched. Um, a lot of these beneficials are kind of cannibalistic, interestingly enough. Uh, flower flies or hover flies, serpid flies, they have a lot of different names. Um, these are important pollinators, but uh, the larvae are very uh, active aphid feeders and uh, they're very attracted to pollen and nectar um, on asters uh, or sunflowers specifically. Um, the parasitic wasp, um, maybe a lot of you guys have seen this image. If not, you know, when we're talking about parasitoids, they're not a true parasite because most parasites will live, will, will take resources from their host, but never kill the host. Um, when we're talking about parasitoids, um, they feed on their host and they eventually, the host does succumb. This is one example of a Braconid family wasp or the Cotesia wasp, where it, it inserts... Um, the, the female is able to take its ovipositor and insert eggs but right underneath the skin of the tomato hornworm, which can totally defoliate tomato plants. And then those eggs hatch and the larva end up producing a, a cocoon that um, is on the, the upper backside of the worm. And they know just to eat uh, just the non the non-essential organs on the, the tomato hornworm so that it can provide uh, nourishment for all of these uh, hatching eggs and larva. And then uh, ultimately the adult wasp will hatch out of the cocoons and the tomato hornworm will eventually succumb and this life cycle will perpetuate and the adults uh, will have multiple generations each year and uh, go out and, and, uh, and do it all over again. And uh, there's, there are other um, parasitic wasps. There, there are a variety of parasitic wasps um, that do similar things. Uh, this is um, an aphid parasitoid, uh, which inserts its eggs inside of living aphids. Uh, and then they ultimately, uh, the, the young feed on the inside of the aphids and then cut these you know, perfectly concentric circular holes out the backside of the aphids. And this is an example of, these are extremely small wasps. They're like the size of a gnat. And if your eyes aren't trained to identifying them, you, you may you know, decide to spray insecticidal soap or a horticultural oil, which is an organic product. And one that I would recommend is, is you know, kind of on the, on the spectrum of risk and, and environmental toxicity, very low, but um, these wasps are, gonna, are, are going, it's going to be lethal to them just as much as it would be to the aphids. So um, I would encourage you, especially if you have a lot of aphid issues, which, um, are typically going to be more earlier, cooler season type of pest, but depending on what you're growing, uh, rare that the plant totally succumbs to aphid. I would encourage you to use aphids if you have them as a pest in your garden as sort of a, a, a bellwether or an, a, uh, an observation point where if you um, monitor that pest See if you can see if you uh, are able to identify beneficials intervening before um, applying, or at the very most, uh, using a strong spray of water to eliminate aphids rather than um, trying to control with um, with a uh, organic pesticide. Assassin or wheel bugs; these are really menacing looking, but they're predators. They feed on caterpillars, moths, other soft-bodied insects. Um, they have instars with the more of a red body, like in the top right hand corner, and then ultimately they get quite large, um, which you can see down at the bottom middle. Um, and these actually can bite you if you try to handle them, which it can be kind of painful, but, um, but more or less they're, they're managing and, and feeding on pests in the vegetable garden. So you you want to see these guys. Minute pirate bug. This is another really uh, uh, great um, predator. So it feeds on thrips, aphids, mites, uh, white flies, moths, and uh, will eat insect eggs. And uh, it has several generations each year. Um, the nymph can look kind of like an aphid in some ways. So 
um, just, you know, like I said, it's just, these are just examples of things like that you might see out in the garden, think that it's uh, a risk or a threat to your crop and actually is providing uh, beneficial services. I think the last beneficial that we'll talk about and then we'll move on to some of the actual pests and managing those pests are parasitic flies or tachinid, uh, tachinid flies. And um, this encompasses like thousands of um, fly species. They're one of the most prevalent uh, parasite flies that we have. And, um, and they kind of look like a horse fly, except they have these really sort of pokey bristles um, at the tip of their abdomens. And uh, they are really creative in terms of how they uh, par parasitize their, um, their hosts. So the female can leave eggs near uh, foliage where the pest insect is feeding, like even squash bugs, for example. And then those squash bugs will feed on the eggs, actually ingest them. They'll hatch inside their body and um, and then the larva will eventually come out and pupate. Um, the pupa kind of look like tomato fruit, worm, uh, tomato, excuse me, corn earworm or tomato fruit worm. Um, and so it's important that you make a good ID and, and don't eliminate the pupa if you see them and mistake them for that uh, tomato fruit worm. Um, but the female can insert the eggs in a variety of different ways into the pest post. Um, so understanding the bad guys. Um, I want to make sure that we have enough time to have a conversation here and, and answer questions about which specific pests people are dealing with. Um, so I might move kind of quickly and then kind of see what kind of questions that we have. But obviously we're trying to, we need to know when to intervene, like the top right hand corner when I see one spotted cucumber beetle versus when I see a tremendous outbreak of squash bugs on my pumpkins. You know, one I might wait and see and one, you know, I need to do something quick. Um, so something that I'm definitely seeing in the gardens right now are uh, sort of an increased population of our cabbage worms, which um, definitely is a late spring, uh, you know, is when these moths and butterflies start to appear. I usually am looking for the imported cabbage worm, which is a butterfly, because the rest of those uh, uh, feeding worms uh, which will totally decimate uh, anything in the cabbage or broccoli family. Uh, the, the imported cabbage worm is the only one that's not nocturnal, the only one that's not a moth. And so you can see that white butterfly and you're like, oh, wow, this beautiful white butterfly, it's floating around. This is exactly what Zach told me about. This is the diversity I've been trying to achieve in my garden. Actually, no, that white butterfly is laying eggs on your cabbage leaves. And very soon you will start to see these um, these uh, sort of, well, you may not see them because they will be sort of camouflaged except for the cross-striped cabbage worm. Most of them are almost identical color green. Um, and so uh, this is uh, one intervention here would be putting on row cover or using the, the surround, the cal and clay product that I mentioned, or is like starting that at the beginning of the season when you transplant. And that can make um, it difficult either creating that barrier with row cover or using the, uh, the powder spray, the cowl and uh, clay spray. Um, but once the, the caterpillars are feeding, you either need to go out there and hand remove them or using something like Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a soil bacterium. It's a, it's a product that I would highlight. It's one of the most recommended products in terms of organic pesticides. And that's because it's very selective and it only uh, is lethal to caterpillars. Um, and so uh, with some exceptions, but that's mostly the case. You wanna, you'd still wanna be careful around, um, uh, you know, monarch uh, larva uh, or caterpillars uh, and some like swallowtail, uh, depending on your affinity for uh, different pollinators and, and butterflies. Um, but other than that, it wouldn't have necessarily a lethal impact on bees or some of the other beneficial insects that we've talked about. Spinosad is a stronger bacteria or a microbial product that is widely available in garden stores, um, but that's non-selective. And that's gonna be both a contact and ingested. Bacillus needs to be ingested. BT is it sometime abbreviated, typically needs to be ingested. Um, by the by, the pest, 
uh, but spinosad uh, can work as a contact as well as an ingested. Uh, it has a, a lower residual than, um, than some, but uh, I would say in order of ecological impact, Bacillus thuringiensis is probably the best option because like I said, it's very selective. It, spinosad will, would kill really anything it came into contact with. Um, once it's been applied, those residuals uh, are usually um, not as effective as a contact. So certain beneficials or bees, if they just came into contact with spinosad that had dried on the leaves, um, it, it's not quite as toxic, uh, but uh, BT would be a better option for this crop. Cucumber beetles, um, like I said, the feeding isn't necessarily the biggest issue with cucumber beetles. Um, selecting, uh, possibly selecting varieties that produce less cucurbitacin and, um, and selecting varieties that have resistance to bacterial wilt and, cu and cucumber mosaic virus because that's ultimately what, what our cucumber plants succumb to um, with these uh, insect pests because they're vectors, they carry those diseases and when they feed, um, the plants are infected and, and ultimately it, takes out with, in the case of bacterial wilt, takes out their vascular system. Um, floating row cover early in the season, uh, um, planting a little bit later or earlier, starting with transplants. I can't recommend that enough when we're talking about anything in the cucurbit family. Um, starting with transplants as early as possible, letting the plants get a head start on these pests so that they're not as vulnerable, small, they're more well-established. Um, that can go a long way too. Um, you can use spinosad or neem, which we'll talk about in just a second, but is, a, um, is an extract from a tree in, a tree in Asia and in India. Um, and uh, it has uh, certain anti-feedant and, um, and anti-growth and anti-reproductive properties. Uh, it's, um, uh, you know, it's a very widely available organic product. And in, in, in combination, uh, I shouldn't say, but rotating either spinosad or neem can be effective, but you need to be careful applying either early in the day, late in the evening and making sure that um, you're not affecting beneficials or pollinators. Although if there are beneficials on the plant, if you're using a product like spinosad or neem, um, neither of those are very selective and could damage beneficials just as much as um, your pest insects. Spider mites, I didn't really, I don't know if we included that on the survey, but um, you know, generally I think spider mites, you're one of your best options um, outside of some of the beneficials that we talked about, using a strong water spray on the undersides of the leaves um, and possibly using a horticultural oil uh, or an insecticidal soap. Um, Squash bugs, I know everybody here has issues with squash bugs. It's kind of the same recommendation, understanding the generations, they come out as adults, they overwinter as adults, they overwinter usually in plant residues. So making sure that sanitation, like a cultural practice here is really a, a major key. So removing vines and debris from last year's season and make sure that we're either composting them well, which probably many of us aren't getting our compost quite hot enough to really break down um, and um, destroy some of these residues and the pests that are living on them. But if you do, if you get your compost hot enough and you manage it well, or, or throwing away the vines, or in some cases, plowing them under, um, but making sure that we're really cleaning up areas and then rotating our planting to a new location in the field. Using row covers, the, the, the thing we need to be thinking about with row covers though, especially with plants that require pollination, which most of these um, fruiting melons and cucumbers and squash are, is that that row cover needs to be removed when, flower, when, when the plants are starting to flower. And so usually removing it for some period of the day during the flowering periods, and then putting the netting back on, or at least keeping the netting on up into the point of flowering. Um, these squash bugs, like once they become an adult, they're really almost impervious to a lot of the um, pesticides that we have access to in the organic world. But um, using a product like um, neem or spinosad, um, and even maybe which is something I haven't talked about, pyrethrum, um, which comes from the chrysanthemum plant, 
but is very broad spectrum and is, is probably one of the more toxic organic insecticides that are out there and not selective at all. Um, those products can be somewhat effective during the very early stages after eggs have hatched. Go turn over the undersides of the leaves. If you have a credit card or you have some duct tape that you can invert and wrap around your hand, um, because those eggs can be really stuck on there. But as many of those eggs that you can remove um, and be on the lookout and, and, and turning the undersides of the leaves over and looking during that right near where the petiole or the stem attaches to the leaf, that, that center rib or center vein is usually where those eggs are located at. Um, well, we have about five minutes left here. And so I don't know, um, Dennis, uh, if you're seeing questions that are coming up, um, burning questions, because I do, I can go over some of these products and that was kind of one of my intentions. Um, anything that like needs to be answered, talking into a black hole here, anybody hear me? Excuse me. I saved two or three <laughs> questions for the end. I you did the wrong button. I it's saved okay. two or three questions for the end, uh, more general. But if you want to run through these, we'll see how our yeah. time goes. Yeah, let's go. Let's go through some of the products that are available. Okay. Um, we'll start with oil and minerals. Horticultural oils, I think, have a rap for being too abrasive. Um, they're mostly considered something that you would use like as a dormant spray on, on fruit trees for scale and mite insects. Um, they essentially, you know, they, they, they create, they uh, cover the pores on the outside of eggs or overwintering um, scale and insects and basically make it so that their body can't respire. And that is one effective uh, product, but it also can be used now. There are products that are that are available for spring and summer use as well. And for aphids and spider mites, um, that can be really effective tool. Insecticidal soap, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't encourage people to go out and make their own soap from detergents. Um, this is actually a certified organic product that is uh, made from um, salt, salts of fatty acids that are derived from plant and vegetable oils and they're formulated to not be phytotoxic or um, to burn plants. So I would hi highly recommend almost with all cases that instead of trying to make something at home that you buy a product that is labeled um, for use with the crop that you're growing. Um, I highly, highly recommend that. Um, there are some products that EPA has listed as minimal risk pesticides, natural uh, things that are derived from natural ingredients um, like uh, cinnamon oils and, 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 um, and garlic and sulfur. Um, even though some of those products EPA allows for, for use without registration, I would still highly encourage everyone to use products that are labeled, um, that are uh, produced specifically for, for edible vegetable crop production. Um, the cow and clay product we talked a little bit about, diatomaceous earth is really nice. It, they're, foss, they're fossils of algae that are uh, composed of, of silicon and are, have these jagged edges. It's a dust and it works really well against soft-bodied insects. Um, like tomato cutworms, for example, if you can sprinkle a little bit around the outside of the plant, that can be effective. It washes off really easily, but it can also be applied on the plant. So like with uh, squash vine borer, for example, some people have had success using diatomaceous earth, earth at the base of the plant so that when eggs hatch, when moths leave their eggs at the base of the plants, those larvae come into contact with the diatomaceous earth. It cuts their bodies and ultimately they, um, they dry out and die. Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, I already mentioned a little bit, you'll be looking for, although I, this will be listed, there are several strains. The Kurstaki is the most available uh, and widely used strain, especially for caterpillars. And I think it's a really great option when you're talking about um, uh, any sort of cabbage worms, uh, tomato horn worm, uh, 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 corn ear worm, uh, uh, and, even, and even now there are some of the strains that work for Japanese beetle, 
uh, in the grub stage. And it's kind of similar to a nematode where you would apply it as a soak or you would spray the soil, like either in the fall uh, as those grubs um, are feeding in the fall or in the spring as they start to become active and, and, um, and pupate. Um, spinosad is another bacterium. It's a little bit more broad spectrum though. And like I said, um, whenever we're using something broad spectrum, we have an, we, there is a chance that we could be a targeting a beneficial as well. Um, pyrethrum is like the perfect example. It's probably one of the strongest organic insecticides that we have out there. And um, even in synthetic and conventional agriculture, this, this uh, a derivative or a synthetic version of this is what is most common, like the seven product insecticide, um, that, that uh, label is now made with pyrethroids, which are just a, a man-made version of the pyrethrum. And they're made to be a little bit stronger and have longer residuals. But the pyrethrum is just as, as broad spectrum and non-selective and can have, uh, should only be used as a last result when it, or a last option when it comes to, to organic um, gardening. Neem oil, like I said, is um, an extract from the, the neem tree. And, um, you know, it, ha it's, it has insecticidal and fungicide properties. It can interfere with the normal life cycle of insects, including feeding, molting, mating, and egg laying. Um, and, you know, for soft body, instar, or immature uh, pests at early life stages, uh, I'm thinking like squash bugs, and uh, in some case, maybe aphids or thrips or spider mites. Um, and even in some cases with, with cabbage worms, um, people will, will use neem oil. Um, but yeah, with a lot of these products that are that either home remedies or that are from essential oils, I, I, would, I would encourage you to make sure that the product you're using is labeled for edible use. Um, the label is the law and um, you don't wanna make yourself sick or damage your plants. So, um, and there's a lot of snake, there are a lot of snake oils out there and probably things that, um, like I said, I would encourage you to, what I would encourage you to take away from this presentation is that, um, you know, cultural practices and creating a more biodiverse garden should be your first priority rather than purchasing some silver bullet in a, in a container or a jar. Right. Well, thank you, Zach. We appreciate it. <clears throat> We typically have more questions than we have time for, but we will be sure to link several articles related to this session on our website. We hope these resources will help you to answer your questions. Once again, thank you for joining our K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We are so glad you could be here today and to learn about organic pest management for vegetable gardens. We have several interesting sessions coming up in our summer series. Be sure to visit the K-State Garden Hour website to see all of the upcoming topics. This session was recorded and will be posted on the website by tomorrow afternoon. After this webinar ends today, we you will receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill out this survey. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you have any questions for us, please don't hesitate to reach out at gardenhour at ksu.edu. Thank you again, everyone. We hope you continue to tune in in the first Wednesday of each month. Have a great week.